Welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. Thank you for joining us for the conversation on the shortage of nurses. It's no secret, we all know there is a shortage of nurses nationwide and here in central Illinois. We're going to be discussing solutions, some of them short term, some of them long term, on how we might fill the gap in the nursing shortage and have that conversation. I've invited Teresa Adelman Mullally to join us. She is with Illinois State University Mennonite College of Nursing where she's an assistant professor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Also with us, Kim Blakey. Kim is OSF Healthcare Vice President of Clinical Business Strategic Operations and thank you for joining us. Thank you. I open by saying there's a shortage of nurses. I don't want to get bogged down in numbers, but how severe is this shortage? Pre-pandemic, we started with a fair amount of nursing openings that we've had short and long-term strategies to address. With the pandemic, we've seen that um, at probably its worst, near double, um, and we're beginning to make strides to correct that, but there's a continued um, shortage and need to work on strategies to improve. And turning to nurse educators, which is your specific field, although you were an RN to start with, but, Correct. but the pipeline, I mean, OSF Healthcare, Unity Point, et cetera, et cetera, all need nurses. How well are you doing in increasing the number of nursing candidates for these facilities? Well, specifically at our institution, we end up turning away about 100 students. So we have just entered a collaborative um, project with Memorial in Springfield, and we're going to be opening an additional site where we're gonna now be able to have 48 additional students in the fall. So that will help because that'll increase our enrollment, which will then increase the number of nurses that, nurses that enter the pipeline. And that agreement is, does what? I mean, it adds students, but are they, is that for clinical purposes? And as well as theory. So that will be those students, that will be their site for their education, both theory as well as clinical. Um, OSF Healthcare has colleges of nursing, one in Rockford, one in Peoria. Do you have similar arrangements in, in order to try to, I mean, you've got your own college of nursing, maybe we can get those people to go to OSF. Yeah, we have strategies to increase enrollment at both colleges of nursing. Um, in addition to partnering with all community resources for education on increasing the amount of clinical time that we're able to extend to those programs. Um, we have partnered with our healthcare advanced analytics to help create a program that really manages that time so that we can offer more hours, um, times of day, nursing types of units um, for those programs to increase enrollment broadly. Teresa, what's the definition of clinical time? Well, it's actually, I think the clinical time she's talking about is that nursing student with patient with an instructor present. But there's other ways to do clinical time. One of them is simulation. So we're allowed to have up to 25% of our hours to be in simulation with the other 75% being in that face-to-face um, -face with a patient. Simulation would mean mannequin? It could be. It could be what's called a low fidelity mannequin where the mannequin is a shell, right? And you could do all sorts of very low risk but high frequency items such as learning to turn or make the bed with somebody in the bed. You also have higher fidelity mannequins which have a lot of bells and whistles, technology. You can have that mannequin actually have their heart stop and have the team respond in a CPR. The third option is having what's called a standardized patient which is essentially a very well prepared actor and a, they, a human being. Yes, and they get into the role of the patient, and that is especially important um, with learning about how to communicate, because while you can speak to a mannequin and we can have you script to a mannequin, it's not the same as speaking to a person, and that makes it far more authentic, especially with issues like mental health. Kim, as the nurses come out of nursing school, they graduate with an RN or a, a bachelor's, um, then and I assume ISU would be a bachelor's degree? Well, we actually have a multiple number of degrees. So we have the bachelor's degree, we have a master's degree, and we have the doctorate in nursing practice, and we have a PhD. 
So a multitude of tracks. But before I get to Kim, uh, just mm -hmm. is RN, I mean, do people graduate with RNs from ISU? So the RN is the test or the exam that anybody who has graduated with a qualifying degree is then qualified to sit for that exam to meet that standard that then says, yes, I know enough, I'm safe, I'm a safe practitioner, I can now take care of folk. So that's what the RN is, it's the licensure. The education is the degree. So as we get more of these uh, nursing students who have now graduated and said, well, I'm, I'm gonna come to OSF Healthcare and, and work, they're new, they know the medical issues, but they have to acclimate to the OSF healthcare environment? And does that cause any issues in terms of, are there enough seasoned nurses to give them guidance? That's something that we always have to balance. And so we have very structured transition to practice or onboarding programs where we partner nurses with um, preceptors that have more experience. And so we have to, as our workforce changes, and we have more newer nurses than we have seasoned with retirements and other things that are trending. Um, we have to be a little more creative with how we manage that. And so we're looking at um, support by having dedicated onboarding units, having virtual support for precepting, and innovative ideas like that to meet the needs so that we can support new nurses in providing high quality care at all times. So the issue of the lack of nurses, we know that, th and this was true before the pandemic, but it was even worse during the pandemic. Do, do, do there were retirements, maybe a little bit earlier than they had anticipated. That's one issue. But what else led to this significant shortage? I would say that um, the work has changed a little bit and become a little more intense in our acute care settings. Um, COVID illness was prevalent for a long time, um, increasing the acuity on some of our nursing areas, or the workload is probably a better word as far as acuity. And so the job became a little bit harder to do, wearing full PPE while you're giving care and things like that. And so we saw um, nurses leave the workforce earlier than planned for retirement, and we saw some leave the, the profession altogether, going into other types of work. And so we've really had to think about how that has changed the needs of our workforce and really adapt our programs and our practices in order to meet the, change, the changes. So we have things like we're working on hiring differently. Um, we used to really look at the organizational needs and interview a uh, you know, broad array of candidates and then make selections on who we hire. And we really had to pivot to compete with not only other healthcare organizations, but other industries. And so we really adapted to have a more candidate-centric hiring process from the application point on. And so we really connect with nurses specifically um, as soon as they apply and start to talk to them about their needs and their interests and what their career goals are, and then match them to the right um, initial position and put them on a pathway or trajectory um, that meets their needs. And so that's really a, a big change um, in the industry. In, in a similar vein, uh, the seasoned nurse, if I may use that term, uh, they, they may have burnout. Do you accommodate them not only with counseling, but in terms of maybe accommodating their interest in work schedule, things of that nature? Yes, we really have a lot of initiatives, short and long term, on work-life balance. And so really meeting nurses where they are in their career, whether they're a new nurse and has specific needs for scheduling or a seasoned nurse who may um, want a lesser amount at the bedside um, for physical reasons. And so we've really, um, rather than having set or fixed positions, really try and meet individuals where they are, whether they wanna work 40 hours a week or 32 hours a week, um, as far as the amount of total hours. And then we've also taken work-life balance in another aspect and really looked at how many weekends and holiday commitments mission partners have. We call our employees mission partners um, so that we can meet their needs. For example, we have 
many long-term nurses that are very experienced that say, you know, really at this point in my career, I love what I do, but I really just want to be home on the weekends with my family at this point, or I want to know that I have the holiday off. And so we're really looking at um, years of experience-based programs. We're looking at offering a different weekend compensation level to draw in um, people that want to have that additional income and are willing to work the weekends to alleviate those that don't want to from having to do so. And that allows us to be more competitive across the care continuum and with other industries that maybe don't have to work weekends. You know, we have to cover our patient care needs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we've really worked hard on being a little more creative. So that work-life balance is important today. It's very important. Let me turn back to uh, the pipeline, getting more nurses to hospitals, et cetera. Uh, what role does the state legislature play? I, in, I know there's multifaceted solutions, but the state legislature can have an impact. There is one particular bill that is probably going to be uh, uh, so important, and that's essentially it's about the compact, meaning uh, there's a bill um, on the floor that I am an, a nurse, I am licensed in Illinois, and if we were a compact state, then I could practice maybe through telehealth or something like that with, an, with a state that's also in that same compact. So I can cross straight state lines, whether physically or through technology, and that would help add more access to quality care for the people we serve. So, so that's an important piece of legislation. So currently, if someone was licensed in Missouri, let's say, they could not practice telehealth or in person in Illinois? Not without an, an additional license, their Illinois license. So this would mean you could hold one license, practice in multiple states. And that has a huge impact when it comes to education as well. The, if you're going to teach in a course uh, or a, a program that brings in students from all these, and you're doing virtual work, many times you have to have these other licensures, so it would really release a lot of burden. There's a couple of bills dealing with money, mm -hmm. uh, Senate Bill 1315 and 1316. Uh, that has to do with uh, helping educators financially? Um, I know one of them is it's almost a, a repayment. So, uh, you know, I can, I get paid and then uh, for my education, and then I give back some time in service. Is that one that you're referring to? And, and we need to point out these are bills. Correct. These they're are not not laws yet. They're no. They have not. They're not that far yet. Uh, let me turn back to you, Kim. Um, th there's a problem. It, it, it was kind of a solution, but it also created a problem, and that is what we call traveling nurses. It used to be called visiting nurse association, what have you, but. Traveling nurses, explain the solution that they presented and then present the problem that grew out of that. Sure. So we've always used what we would call an external agency nurse or travel nursing program in healthcare. And the initial intent was to really meet hard to fill needs or short term shortages in a workforce. Let's say we had a, a rise in census that we didn't think would sustain. You would pull in an agency nurse rather than filling a full time position. So there's been a place um, for that long term. Those nurses pre pandemic um, made around um, two to three times the, the core nurse and paid. Um, for that flexibility and agility to go travel and be away from home. When we, the pandemic started, we saw a rapid rise in the rate of pay for travel agency nurses. And at the same time, a rapid rise in the need to have more nurses work at the bedside. And so those two things really drove the cost up um, about triple the baseline rate. Um, in some areas and in some specialties. So, so a travel nurse, to be clear, a travel nurse could make three times as much money as a then co-worker who is employed by the hospital? No, that's not the comparison I'm talking about. I'm talking about the baseline rate for the agency nurse. Oh, for the agency nurse. It, okay. In some cases, almost tripled All right. um, the hourly rate, which then created even a wider separation from the, the frontline nurse that was a core mission partner working um, next to them. 
And so that increased. And so we had many nurses leaving their local across the nation, not just in our community. Um, we had many nurses leaving their bedside roles working for a specific entity and going out to earn that higher rate of pay. So when you attracted a traveling nurse, you probably lost nurses to travel elsewhere. Correct. That is not, I mean, is, is that difference starting to come closer together? Yes, we are seeing um, nationally the labor rate or the rate of pay for agency nurses coming back down to pre-pandemic levels. And so that's really helping bring some of the nurses back to their home communities. Um, and, and throughout the pandemic, we adjusted that rate of pay for the local nurses to stay and work at the one entity um, to a level that was a little more competitive with the agency rate. Do you offer bonuses at all for certain situations? To that's in terms of retention of nurses. Yeah, we've, we have retention programs. Um, at times, we've offered um, incentives to stay in their frontline nursing role. Um, and then we also have incentives on a daily basis at times to help fill some of the greater needs. Let's stay on the topic of money with you, Teresa. And that is uh, I, uh, a nursing student at ISU Mennonite College of Nursing um, might want to go to um, OSF or Unity Point or St. Anthony's in Rockford, what have you, urban areas. But where we know that the significant shortage is, is in rural areas. Oh. Is, it, is there a program in place to help attract nurses to the smaller facilities? There are a number of programs where if I'm the student, um, I find out about this program, I apply, they pay my education, and in turn, I agree to work in that rural facility or area that they have the need that they've already identified. Um, so I get my education and I have a job. It's pretty win-win. I would add to that that we're looking at programs really for educational assistance that are really broad and innovative. Um, increasing not only the amount that we cover, but the types of programs. And, and as a healthcare system, that's not limited to just nursing. We're mm -hmm. looking at supporting um, pathways and career development for all of the roles that we need in healthcare. Yep, because nursing does not operate in a silo. Right. It's a team. We talked about telehealth earlier. Does that help in terms of the, sh you have a certain number of patients, they need help, you only have a limited number of nurses. Does that help in terms of, I'll use the term, lightening the workload, so to speak, that the patient may not be in the, they're not in the, in the facility, they're not in the hospital, but they need guidance on some issue? Yes. We had pre-pandemic um, have telehealth roles that really help support the care team. Um, as far as like intensive care, we have an EICU program that really helps do some overwatch and support the front line um, from physician and nursing standpoint. Um, now, with the shortage in the workforce for nursing, we are looking um, very in depth at lots of different ways to supplement that care, um, looking at our patient care delivery models. And so we are looking at team nursing would be one example where you partner a nurse with a nursing assistant type role and have them deliver care a little bit differently. Really focusing in on training the nurses how to delegate and empower the team in the right areas so that we can deliver the same level of quality and safety um, at the bedside. So we're looking at that. And then we're also looking at solutions, like you mentioned, with telehealth. So adding support virtually for some of the things that can be done um, remotely like admission questionnaires, planning for discharge, um, and even supporting our frontline nurses with mentoring and precepting in some cases where we have a newer experience mix um, really offering um, a different level of support. Uh, I want to talk about another bill that's in uh, the hopper right now down in Springfield. That's Senate Bill 199 where it's going to amend the Nurse Practice Act so that a nurse can administer Schedule II drugs 
without getting the doctor to say, yes, you can do that. Is, is that helpful? Yes, I think that is helpful. So that will allow us to um, utilize our resources to the highest and best use of their education and training and skill mix. Um, for example, we may use that in a rural health setting, um, having an advanced practice nurse be able to be the on-site, in-person um, caregiver or provider, and then support them with telehealth. That's another connection when we think about care delivery models where we would have a physician um, available to answer questions there. And that makes that, um, that a little more feasible or easier to do. And I think an important piece in that particular bill is that there are enough safeguards in there too. That, that nurse practitioner has to have, I can't remember, is it 4,000 hours of practice, which equates to about two years of practice. So it's not that new nurse practitioner graduates are being launched um, to have their own prescriptive authority without a collaborative agreement. It's after having developed some expertise that they now are ready. So it's, it, that's what that bill is helpful with. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the Mennonite Lab. Uh, the Mennonite College of Nursing has a new building that will open next year, 2024. How might that help in terms of practical experience for your nurse students and maybe even increase the number of students that you can handle? Right now, we are probably operating at max capacity. Um, so adding that space is going to be so important to be able to add more simulation, um, to be able to increase the number of students we have because they have to have a certain amount of clinical experiences in order to be eligible to sit for that registered nurse exam that we were speaking of earlier. So, and the simulation plays such an important role. Right now, we, I mean, we're on top of each other. So that's gonna open up space, make, give a little bit more breathing room. And there are certain kinds of simulations that require a bit more space. And so that will also help as well. People hear a lot about the Jump Trading Simulation Center. Uh, and, and know very little about it. And, and there's a lot of experimental work that's going on there, a lot of research. But does that relate to nursing in some capacity? Yeah, it directly relates to nursing and how we deliver education. Um, you talked about um, newer nurses coming in. We also have um, simulation, whether it's with mannequins or whether it's with standardized um, patients. With patients, standardized mm -hmm. patients. Yes, um, there as well. And so it really allows us to be a little more innovative and creative with the way that we deliver education. And, and that's changing as well. You know, more and more um, we think about the changing workforce um, and their needs. We have often traditionally held education where we would pull people into a meeting or a classroom and do one on one or a group setting and deliver material. And the newer workforce, they learn by watching YouTube, right? They, if they need to do something, they open up the um, app and they learn how to do it. And so we're really looking at platforms and innovation that allow us to deliver just in time training, um, which is it, what the workforce is asking for. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, we, we have these issues with the nurse, we have to work together. And so one thing that clinical practice partners have done has, they've really changed their orientation for the new graduate to really extend um, that. It is no more just throw you in the deep end and hope you can swim. So kudos to the practice partners that have done that. And to that end, we have a higher expectation of, of what we need to do to prepare that graduate. So we're really trying to work to meet in the middle. So we have simulation, they have simulation. We're really trying to bridge that gap. I'd like to spend the last uh, two minutes, um, maybe a minute each, uh, on a hopeful note. Um, starting with you, Teresa, what, what do you see in terms of the fix? How are we doing in filling that gap with uh, the shortage of nurses that currently exists? Well, one thing I think that's very important is our accreditation standards um, for AACN have changed. And like I said, we are being expected to do more in the amount of time that we have with our students to get them ready. The one piece I'm so excited about, we I think we talked about burnout, is that one of the newest elements of this competency is we have to prepare our students to be able to take care of themselves. In the culture of nursing, nurses have been 
great at taking care of other people. And that's going to be so important that nurses can do that for themselves and the organizations are prepared to um, have a system that adapts with that. And briefly with you, Kim, your hope for filling the gap. Yeah, I think we have to continue to be innovative and creative and, and really change as the needs of our workforce and nurses change. And so we're hopeful um, and we have the support of our leaders to really um, be creative and do things like work-life balance and also be creative and when we address burnout, like offer positions that maybe a nurse can be at the bedside and also um, teach half-time. And with that, the half hour is expired. Thank you to Teresa Edelman Malali of the ISU Mennonite College of Nursing and to Kim Blakey, who is with OS OSF Healthcare. Thank you both for the conversation. We hope you continue the conversation at home and then join us again next time when on that issue we'll be talking about child abuse. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. We'll talk about that issue next time. See you then. <laughs>